All right. <clears throat> ah, yeah, back at it. 20.8. Four chapters left for me to record. Aside from the very, very last one. And then... I'm done. I will be finished with the Parahuman series. Try to believe it. Okay, I believe I have everything in order. Yep. Alright. Well, let's jump right in. Okay, <coughs> hail hydrate. Arc 20, Last, Chapter 8 Chris, Cryptid, Lab Rat, stood opposite the three of us, slouched forward, guarded, the glare on his monstrous, rat-like face a constant. With the lights partially off, likely because of damage to the facility, he was mostly lit from behind. The source of that lighting was a dozen or so monitors spread around a lab that twenty or so individuals might use. Eight of those twelve monitors were showing images of Riley Davis, Bonesaw. Most from a head-on angle, most shot from cameras small enough that the image has... Eh, already flood. Didn't even make it a minute in. Of those twelve monitors... Oh my god, what's... What's happening, man? Whoa, 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 what's going on here? Eight of the What in the world? Is that coming through on my screen too? Um Hold on a second. What in the world is happening? Testing, testing. Testing, testing. What in the hell? It's recording using my mic. Okay. What the heck is happening? What is going on here? Testing, testing. Testing, testing. God. I got something, something on the laptop's end because that's not coming through my interface. Um, oh jeez. What is going on? I need to, I need to unplug this and plug this back in. Uh, give me just a moment. Testing, testing. Test, test. Test, test. Okay, all right, there we go. Jesus. That was, that was very strange. Um, okay, well, anyway, my mic is not exploding anymore. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Well, technical difficulties resolved. Let's get to this again. Arc 20, Last, Chapter 8 Chris, cryptid, lab rat, stood opposite the three of us, slouched forward, guarded, the glare on his monstrous rat-like face a constant. With the lights partially off, likely because of damage to the facility, he was mostly lit from behind. The source of that lighting was a dozen or so monitors, spread around a lab that twenty or so individuals might use. 
Eight of those 12 monitors were showing images of Riley Davis, bone saw, most from a head-on angle, most shot from cameras small enough that the images had a fishbowl effect. She leaned toward the cameras while trying to make out details, which put her eyes at a level where the fishbowl effect magnified them widely in comparison to the rest of her face. The rest of the screens I could make out showed what I imagined were regular laboratory readouts. Graphs, tables, molecular chains. I felt cold in this stark, dimly lit space. My mind stumbled, trying to parse what he'd just said. I was too tired, and so soon after the engagement with the Seamorg I simply didn't trust my own judgment or senses. A part of me wanted to deny this reality, refocus, and move forward anyway. I needed medical care, so did Rain, and Sveta needed to get calm. Whatever happened, we'd be doing that, so... It made sense to turn, go to the first aid kit, and get started. I couldn't bring myself to budge. I stared at Chris, as emotions belatedly crept in. Instincts or an awareness I would have called instincts before they'd turned out to be as faulty as they were proving to be now, they told me he was too guarded, too intense. And the reality was, as logic joined my emotions in arriving late to this party, we didn't have time to fuck around. We were about to hand Fortuna everything she needed to win. Cryptid, I said, my voice low, my tone quiet. Tell me that you haven't made it yet, that you're almost done. Cryptid shook his head slowly. His fur was gradually changing from brown to black. Riley, I said, you there? I'm here, the voice came through. I didn't hear his response, and the camera isn't giving me a good view of him. He just shook his head. Was there not time? There was time. I talked him through the steps. It's a set, or it should be set. Oh, it's not a set. It is set. Oops. Was there not time? There was time. I talked him through the steps. It's set, or it should be set. Why? What happened? That's exactly what I'm wanting to know, I said. I met Chris's eyes. The orbs remained unchanged, and the narrow pupils focused on me even as the flesh around the eyes changed and rippled, becoming thicker, with more creases and lines. Flesh turned from light brown to stark white, while dark... Stark white with dark modeling. Bah. Eyes changed and rippled, good run going becoming there. thicker, with more creases and lines. Flesh turned from light brown to stark white with dark mottling around the lines, folds, and creases, like pigmentation had all leaked in there. It made the contrast of the dark fur, dark feathers, more stark. Did you have another idea? Rain asked. This isn't the time to be cagey, Sveta said. No cage or caginess. Chris said. You had the project idea. Riley Davis knew the steps to take and talked me through them. I decided to do something else instead. What was that something? I asked. Insurance. For? I asked, my voice tense, quiet. My collarbone was radiating pain with every heartbeat, and my heartbeat was so heavy, I felt it was trying to... Oh, I felt it was rock... I felt like it was rocking that... Ugh. Got that wrong multiple times there. Quiet. Felt like it was rocking My collarbone was radiating pain with every heartbeat, and my heartbeat was so heavy, I felt like it was rocking my entire body. For us? For humanity? For me. They're looking at it. The fur was becoming feathers. The way it changed color suggested it was more than normal hair or feathers, alive from root to tip. 
Why the fuck, why did you drop it? Yeah, I stumbled a bit in there. Or than normal hair or feathers. Alive from root to tip. Why the fuck, why did you drop it? I asked. Did you not fathom what we're trying to do? I fathom, he said. His tone of voice had changed a fraction with his ongoing transformation. I'm not sure I fathom the big plan, Rain said. But Victoria thinks it might work. The warden leadership thinks it's doable as a last-ditch resort. I trust them. If you think it won't work, I'd love to hear why. You're pretty smart when it comes to stuff like this. I think it might work, Chris said. Then why? I asked, with all the intensity I could muster with my collarbone as fucked up as it was. Because it might not, Chris told me. Because it requires you to have faith in everyone out there. He extended a knobby finger, tipped by a black nail. And I don't. What do you think is going to happen, Cryptid? I asked. How is what you're doing better? What happened with the Seamorg? He asked. Answer my questions first. The scream tapered off. I don't think she died. She left. From the state of you and your focus on this, you did enough damage to her that you're fairly confident she's not about to pull off her endgame. Answer the questions, Chris, Sveta said. I don't trust the people out there. I do trust the Seamorg's malice. That world she wants to create, where everyone's screaming, I can deal. I can keep my mind intact. A world with nobody to bother me. I can read books, comics, and catch up on old games for as long as I want. Chris, there are so many things wrong with that, I don't even know where to begin, Sveta said. That you think anyone could be happy or sane with zero human contact for that long. Like the people you sent off to a prison world? he asked. No, I can manage, trust me. I know myself. And if I want company, I can pick someone and inoculate them. The power dynamics would be so fucked up doing that, Sveta said. Not if I picked the right people. A tinker like Riley Davis here. No, Riley said through the computers. I don't want it. Not the inoculation, not that life, and not with you. If I could keep myself from coming after you for letting the world fall into the Endbringer's clutches, I'd eventually lose it and come after you at some other points. Chris glanced back over his shoulder. He shrugged, slow, languid, and deliberately. Keeps things interesting. I wouldn't make it interesting, lab rat, Riley said. Oh, she said her tone light. Languid and deliberately. Keeps things interesting. I wouldn't make it interesting, lab rat, Riley said her tone light. I'd make it final. No chance, no deliberation, no conversation or warning beforehand. I've spent too long trying to find the me in between the normal and the monsters. Fine, Chris said. For a second or two, his eyes weren't looking at anything in particular, as if he was visualizing something or reconciling something. I really don't care that much. The Seamorg is hurt, Chris, I said. She doesn't win this one. She's hurt, and she's not stupid. Stupid is the wrong word, I told him. She's a force of nature. You forget. I have the memories of someone who spent years in the birdcage. Talking to some of the biggest monsters out there talking about big things. 
The closest person I had to a friend was an expert in big. I get how these things work, how they move, what pushes them. I got the bird cage more than anyone else. I got Dragon and what she was. I was ready to bargain with solutions and weapons against Endbringers the moment people beyond the birdcage hit their limit and realized they had to ask us for help. I used some of it against Scion, infinite flesh when combined with the right powers. You got caught, you got out by luck, and then you died, Sveta said. Chris, you're not that clever or good. I made the giants. Titan counterweapons that are still out there fighting. Not that it matters. What's going to happen out there is all the capes that have been keeping the machine army and other titans under control are going to go after the Seamorg. They are going to hurt her. Whatever other measures you come up with, you're going to try using them. You're going to spend resources, and you're going to run out of time. She'll recover, because she's far stronger and far more powerful than we pretend she is. She's too hurt, I said, shaking my head more than was necessary for a simple negation. And we just sent the order for Dauntless and Fumehood to link up with Fortuna. Past that point, Fortuna has to win. You'll rescind it. You'll stall once you realize you don't have a plan for endgame. While you're doing that, the Seamorg will come out on top. You really believe that? Oh, no, that's Rain, not Riley. Oh, God damn it! While you're doing that, the Seamorg will come out on top. You really believe that, Rain said, cooped up in this lab, not even following. You didn't see how we cut her in half. I've put all my chips on it, Chris said. She fucking got to you, I said, my eyes widening. No, she didn't. I knew I'd be doing this before we arrived at this facility. I'm the only one here who isn't underestimating her, and I'll be the only one here who can string together two coherent thoughts in the end. Chris, Sveta said, quiet, I should warn you that I'm not in complete control of my body right now. I don't want to kill you, but you're making it very hard to restrain this body's natural impulses. And you'll murder someone you hate again, just, what is it, eight floors up and three hundred feet away from where you murdered the woman who made you what you are? Fuck you, Chris, she said. For what it's worth, he said, I expected you to be upset. Part of what I did with my time was plan countermeasures. This is yours, Sveta. He picked up a syringe from a table big and plastic, holding it in one talon hand. Ninety percent of him was covered in feathers now. She reached for it, and he reacted, fast, pulling his hand back. Sveta caught it on the second attempt, gripping it while he did the same. Neither budged, and the syringe was held by both of them. Let me dash it to pieces against the wall. It's a fix, Chris said. You get a body. Ten fingers, ten toes, belly button, heartbeat, spleen. You'd lose the tattoo. That'd be purged. Your skin would be like anyone's skin. I don't fucking believe you, Chris. She pulled her tendril back. Her arm writhed as a morass for long seconds before returning to something resembling an actual arm in shape. It's not happily ever after, he said. You still lose your mind, whatever form that takes, though I have my suspicion on how she'll tackle this. I don't think it'll be that bad at first. She'll have to spend at least a decade repairing the damage, 
getting things lined up, coordinating everyone and everything, you'll be a little cuckoo, so... Damage. Getting things lined up, coordinating everyone and everything, you'll be a little cuckoo, She'll be nudging you here and there to put you in a convenient little box where you're doing what she needs you to do. Nobody will quite be able to bring themselves to put up a fight. She'll close up the cracks. Chris, I interrupted, are you stalling? No, I'm honestly not, he said. He looked so at ease when he'd just fucked us on every conceivable level. I could go back, report to the warden leadership, and tell them that it was all falling through. But doing that, it meant conceding the issue. It meant doing just what he'd said, holding back the titans, holding back from the end. It brought us back to square one against an enemy who was a hundred steps ahead. The Seamorg might actually win that way. The whole plan. The idea was to give them exactly what they wanted. The Seamorg wanted a fight, wanted conflict, everyone on the planet pushing themselves to the limit, testing a system she'd set in motion. Well, she'd got that. Contained to this one facility, with her as our primary enemy more than each other. Now, Fortuna wanted to end the world. We needed to help her do that. If we balked, if we stopped, we lost. Hesitation when parrying an incoming strike was death. My early sparring with manpower had taught me that much. It was especially true when your opponent was a hundred times stronger than you, if not stronger. No, I couldn't reach out to the wardens. I had to hope that whoever was managing the cameras on Riley's side wasn't listening and making a phone call here. I had to figure this out. Figure out a way. It's a trick. You don't make permanent changes, Sveta told him. Oh, it's real, he said. I can make permanent changes. There were people who went to the same hospitals you did that had permanent alterations, left over after the big changes the original lab rat put them through. I remember. As monstrous as anything I saw at the asylum, Sveta said. Not them. What was done to them. Not full changes, though, I said. It was always possible. I just didn't, because I hadn't decided on one. I needed to decide on a new baseline body and the original lab rat never could decide. In that, at least, I'm different from him. This is me now, forever out of her reach. He was tall, crooked, his joints knobby and his limbs and neck thin. He was covered in black feathers, all of those feathers long, curling at the ends, especially long at the back and undersides of each arm, draping down. No, if it was that easy, you'd have decided long ago, I said. This is a bluff. If you really think I'm bluffing, you're giving yourself way too much credit. At this point, the only reasons you matter to me is that she's eventually going to win and drive each of you insane, and I don't want that insanity pointed at me. So, Sveta can lose her powers. Rain can never sleep again. The two of you can at least be happy that you won't be as good at murdering people as you would be with powers at full strength. As for you, Victoria, I don't know. I don't understand you. Fucking likewise, I said. So I decided the best recourse was to kill you, when and if you ever came after me. I give myself 95% odds even with the new force field tricks. I clenched my fists. The clench of my left hand fist made the skinned portion and the missing fingernail hurt. I could feel the wound from the bullet hole to the bicep, the damage to the collarbone, and the damage to my ribs. 
The pain helped to clarify my thinking. My vision shook because my head shook, and my head shook because I was so rigid, so ready to do something, to take his head off, to freak out. Every breath came with pain. I'd fought the Seamorg in part because I'd wanted to buy time. Time for Chris to build this fucking thing. And he hadn't. Riley, I said, if I went and got another tinker, not necessarily a bio-tinker, do you think you could walk her through it? Chris scoffed, a hollow, eerie sound, even... Bio-tinker, do you think you could walk her through it? Chris scoffed, a hollow, eerie sound through a mouth that incorporated some beak. If she's not a bio-tinker, then no. We could try, but I wouldn't get your hopes up. Time's short. Could you do it? We could work out a way of reaching you. And manage... <clears throat> Need some water. Hail hydrate. short. Could you do it? We could work out a way of reaching you. And manage distribution at the same time? Riley asked. I don't know. I could. Can you start and stay in touch? On it. Portals are down, Chris said. Little Kenzie's portal box that she made with help from Dragon is offline. I checked a minute before you came in. Around that time, the warden started asking about capes who could manage mass trash mass transportation, not trashportation. Aid with help from Dragon is offline. I checked a minute before you came in. Around that time, the wardens started asking about capes who could manage mass transportation. No replies, in part because communication is down on multiple fronts. You can check yourself. I will, Rain said. He looked at Chris. No offense, but I don't trust you right now. Finally getting some sense. Never trust. Sveta's voice was low. Seriously, Chris, I will murder you. If that has uncomfortable parallels with Dr. Mother, then I'll wrestle with those parallels another day. He shook his head. You might have won this battle, but you lost this war. It's the way it always is when it comes to her. When the fights go fast, we think she didn't have time to get things moving in the right ways. When they go slow, we convince ourselves we threw enough wrenches in her way to finally derail her plot. You say I have it wrong when I say she wants to keep me alive, but you're the ones who are misunderstanding all of this. I saw Sveta's arm lose its coherence, and my arm started. Before I realized it was my bad arm, I was slow, and I needed to use my force field anyway. It didn't matter. She held herself back, just barely. I could see it in her eyes. I don't want to betray another so-called teammate, Sveta said, quiet. Then why don't you go? I asked. Can you reach out for help? Um, we need a bio-tinker. You won't find any, Chris said. Or, fuck it, my sis... I paused mid-sentence. She'd been there in the fighting, hadn't she? It felt like a fleeting thought, or something that could have been a false memory. Was that before or after the Mathers giant thing resolved? I couldn't remember what had happened to her, and the fact I couldn't remember came with a heaping of dissonance. It was like having a body that didn't line up, my self-image as a pretty high schooler at stark odds with a wretched, sprawling mass of flesh and tangled limbs, enough to take up every bit of space on a couch, with some hanging... Why? Why is this... Why is this almost a high schooler at sentence? stark odds with a wretched, sprawling mass of flesh and tangled limbs? 
enough to take up every bit of space on a couch, with some hanging over armrests and spilling out to rest awkwardly on the floor. You won't find her. She won't cooperate, Chris said. You don't get it. This is the Seamorg winning. Horror swept over me, belated. A smooth transition from the horror that was so tied into those two years of memory. Victoria, Sveta said, bringing me back to reality just a bit. She was at the doorway. Biotinker, or my sister, or the means of getting Riley and her project to the epicenter of everything. Sveta nodded once, then made her exit from the room, rushing. The door slid closed, banging on impact. A momentary silence followed. It won't be that bad, Chris said. Not for a few generations. That'll be because she's lulling us into a false sense of security, but eh, we'll be dead after that. I don't think you have any conception of what it's going to be like, Rain said. Being mind-controlled in a fucked-up society driven by even more fucked-up systems? I've endured that ever since waking up on the eve of gold morning. Implanted instincts, until I reached the lab where I was forced to fill my head with the original lab rat's memories and experiments. Two years, pretty much. All while this city pretended to be functional. I can tell you that you're way off because I've lived it my entire life until a month ago, Rain said. Your two years is easy compared to that. No, it's not easy at all, Chris said. But it's better than oblivion, and that's what Victoria's plan amounts to. You chose living over oblivion when you decided to wake up and keep going. Every day you lived with the fallen. You made the same damn decision I'm making right now. There was hope then. There is not hope in the Seamorg's world. I can recall the very therapy session when you said it felt hopeless, Rain. No, he did it in a growly voice. Okay. There was hope then. Hey, Vale. There is not hope in the Seamorg's world. I can recall the very therapy session when you said it felt hopeless, Rain, Chris growled. But you kept going. If I respected you for anything, it was for that. Survival first. I joined in. Yeah, fuck that, Chris. Poor fucking you. If that's the bar you're setting, then there isn't one member of Breakthrough, living or dead, who hasn't had to deal with intrusive thoughts identity issues, and living situations that amounted to a kind of hell. You might not be related by blood, but you're definitely related by something, Chris said, his voice low. You and your sister. You just can't get over your own shit. You're actually a monster, I said. I said it a long time ago. I'll say it again. You're more of a monster than I am, Victoria, Chris said. You and your sister deserve each other. It was fleeting, like the impulse I'd used to twitch a finger. A thought. But this thought was tied to triggers and levers. Force field on. Force field opened up. I didn't move a muscle, but my hair stirred as the force field lunged forward, invisible, to cross the thirty feet between me and the end of the lab where Chris stood framed by monitors. He moved, quicker than I would have expected. Taloned claws reached out as the force field bowled over tables, knocked syringes and papers to the floor, and closed the distance to Chris. A taloned hand stabbed at the force field, catching it before it could catch him. Precise, strong, and sharp enough to pop it. Gone like a soap bubble. His long feathers blew in the resulting breeze that followed the sudden termination of those super-strength movements.
movements of force field hands through air. He plans to wear this body indefinitely. He picked a strong one. He can see you. I looked at those black eyes with flecks of red and gold in them. The pupils were like a goat's, rectangular. He lunged, so quickly after his flat-footed, preemptive strike that I almost didn't register it. I flew back to buy myself time, and my force field came back up a second before he reached me. She grabbed a table, tore it from the wall, and slung it his way. He vaulted over it, one leg going out long to rake the force field and break her again before he landed. Even landing was a twisting, multi-layered movement as he turned, grabbing rain as rain produced a silver blade and swung it. Rain was thrown halfway across the room. Rain's landing saw him put both hands out to catch himself. One of those hands was already broken. His reaction immediately after his fall made that clear enough, almost incapacitated. I used my aura, taking hold of desperate feelings in the hopes of driving home the caring, the need, the fact that billions of lives were on the line. Chris didn't even bat an eyelash. Decentralized everything. Detached everything, Chris told me. Do you want to try this again? I'm still confident I'll win. If I wasn't, I wouldn't have been here when you finished with the Seamorg. What do you want, Chris? What can I offer you? Nothing. I refuse to believe that. If it's about your faith in everyone else falling through on... Following. What can I offer you? Nothing. I refuse to believe that. If it's about your faith in everyone else following through on this, give me a test. Let's prove it can work on the small scale. I'm not interested. I clenched my fist, and then I lunged for him again. This time, it was the wretch and me together, pulling apart, attacking him from two different directions. The wretch, fragile but strong. Me, broken but resilient. What are you... He started. He stopped speaking for a moment while protecting himself. The wretch avoided giving him any clear strikes while taking up as much of his con concentration... What are you... He started. He stopped speaking for a moment while protecting himself. The wretch avoided giving him any clear strikes while taking up as much of his concentration as possible. Tables, chunks of the lab's counter, and pieces of computer equipment were leveraged as weapons. Ah, <clears throat> ah. Hail hydrate. I don't know what's going on with my throat today. Chunks of the lab's counter and pieces of computer equipment were leveraged as weapons. I used every technique I'd learned sparring with my mother. Faster than me, more lethal, but there were always stumbles. He wore a body he wasn't used to, and there had to be a weak spot. He clawed at me, caught my breastplate, clawed at me again, caught hair and a bit of my cheek. His elbow hit me in the sternum in a deliberate, measured way, and the pain of broken and fractured bones connected to that point threatened to knock me out. I threw myself at him, all of my strength dedicated to keeping aware and keeping my senses together as I wrapped in a bear hug despite the breaks and fractures I was suffering from. The result wasn't what I'd pictured in my head. I'd thought it would be fierce. Instead, I slumped, leaning hard into him with one side of my body relying on flight to press me into him, his back against a damaged counter. The fragile one held out one of the syringes I'd had her knock to the floor in the first move. Sveta's, the one that was supposed to give her a body, left deliberately behind. Poised, ready to stab Chris, and to take his new Seymour immune body. "'You think I'm scared?' he asked. "'Do you think I'm surprised?' He reached out, 
grabbed the syringe and pulled it toward himself. The needle punctured his body. I thought it was a bluff. We were already playing a game of chicken, me putting off telling the wardens what was happening and getting them to back off on sending the message to Dauntless and Fumehood. Meanwhile, he was standing on the tracks, his own train incoming, the Seamorg pursuing him. We were both at this standoff, but he pressed the plunger. The shri- I was shedding. We were both at this standoff, but he pressed the plunger. The shedding of his monstrous form was as fast as the adoption of it had been. Feathers began to fall away. Pressed against him, I could feel him shrinking. I'll get the immunity I need before she gets to me, he said. I'm not worried. Do you know why I can do that? I asked, quiet, a murmur in his ear. The new tricks, the control. I'm sure you'll tell me. I came to terms with the power and where it comes from, the connections, that I'm worth love, even now, even from myself. That is some Saturday morning cartoon bullshit, he said. It's reality, Chris. You've been struggling. You've been inconsistent, fighting yourself every step of the way. Fighting the past version of you, the you of now. When you're acting young, you hate it because you're not young, not really. When you're acting older, you hate it because it makes you like him. But every time you have the chance to make a move or blame someone or make some sense of it, you turn on others, blame them, and throw up walls. And you don't, he asked. Boundaries are great, Chris. They're essential. This world can be fucked up, so, yeah, use whatever defense mechanisms you've got at your disposal. Some are better than others, but anything's better than having none. I paused. For a second, I wondered if I was going to pass out. How much blood had I lost today? The pain I was experiencing with every heartbeat and every breath was incredible. He didn't butt in, didn't retort. I told him, my words as intense as I could make them, except once you've thrown up those boundaries, built four walls, impenetrable, so high nobody can surmount them, you've still got to be okay with yourself. I don't think you are. I think you're the furthest thing from being okay with yourself. Get off me. I got off him, flying back. The shift of pressures against my ribs made the darkness creep in around the edges for a moment. I think this Seamorg-driven future might not be so bad for the rest of us, but it's going to be a kind of hell for you, Rain said. Worse than any fire and brimstone hell the Fallen preached at me about. Shitty thing is, even though you betrayed us twice now, I don't want that for you. I'm having trouble letting go of you as a friend. I let go of you as a friend a long time ago, Chris said. I'm walking out of this room. If you try to stop me for any reason, I'll make you regret it. I won't rescind the plan, I told him. If we're playing chicken, with an end of the world rushing at each of us, I'll take oblivion over us losing our humanity. If you don't, the wardens will, he said. He started walking toward the door. I floated up, ready to follow, to press the argument. But the simple shift in orientation made my head swim, the darkness creeping in again, my consciousness slipping so very easily, followed by what felt like a desperate two steps forward, one step back uphill struggle to recover. And I wasn't sure what I'd even say. Chris, still shedding feathers, becoming a child again, walked past me. The door slid closed. He was gone. So that's it? Rain asked. The Seamorg wins? The Seamorg set all the pieces down. Everything went where she wanted it, I said. I don't know if she wins, though. For that to happen, 
we need to tell Dauntless and Fumehood to back off. Tell Legend to leave her alone. My voice felt far away. We're not going to do that? Rain asked. No. Okay, good, I think. I would have nodded, but I wasn't sure my consciousness could take that particular beating, not with my collarbone being like it was. No objection. The voice was Riley's from the back of the room. How's the project coming? I asked. Not very well, Riley admitted. I don't have a lot of the things I'd like to have. It's like, if I were explaining it to Mannequin back with the Slaughterhouse Nine, I'd describe it as trying to make an oxygen recycler out of a toilet and a microwave. I don't have the pieces I need. Then, I don't have the means of putting the end product where it needs to be, and... It's not going very well, I echoed her. No, but I'll keep at it. Thank you. It was a good idea, I think. Maybe. I... I started, my words interrupted by the thought. She said it in the past tense. Thanks, I think. I have to say it, or they'd revoke my medical tinker license. But you need medical attention. Okay, I said. I'll get right on that. Who or what do you need? Rain asked. Sveta, I said. Let's... let's get out of this shitty lab. Maybe she found someone. We'll meet her halfway. And if we can't, we'll find someone to patch me together. Sounds like a plan, he said. Can I lean on you? I asked. Might pass out. It'd be great if you could catch me. I shouldn't fly more than necessary. Got it, he said. Gently, I said. Ribs, okay, great. We made our way out of the labs, into the partially lit hallway. Lights flickered here and there. From the hallway, we made our way to the stairs, moving relatively slowly. People were running up and down the stairs. Civilians were out of hiding, the ones who hadn't lost their minds, at least. Some had construction equipment, ladders, and toolboxes. Good people. Good stuff. I sure hoped that however the world ended, we wouldn't be coming back to this fucking place ever again. Please, Sveta. Tell me you found someone. A tinker hiding where the Seamorg couldn't see her. Even my sister. I'll endure her for another conversation if it means that humanity gets to live and stay humanity. I wobbled as we ascended the stairs. Not because of any funny movement, but because of air pressure changes, or another bit of blood loss. I gave Rain's shoulder a squeeze, stopped, then took a seat on the stairs with his help all out of gas. I'll see if I can grab someone, he said. Cool, I replied. Rain made his exit. I watched the people come and go as they headed up and down. One woman stopped by me to give me a bandage to press to my shoulder, even though I already had the coagulant there. It would have been nice to see some familiar faces, Crystal in particular, Finale, Withdrawal, and Karyatid, even Tattletail, damn it. Victoria. I couldn't bring myself to twist around to look up the stairs, but I leaned over to one side, using flight to stay steady, a grimace crossing my face as my ribs strained. Sveta and Jessica came into view, sparing me the need to lean to one side to try and see them. I grunted for breath. Hey, Sveta said. Hey. Um, so your sister's injured. She's not up to helping us. Falling rubble? I asked. Um, yes, but not like you're thinking, Sveta told me. There were eyewitnesses. They saw you looking down from above and staring. They knew the prior relationship. The rubble fell after you left. She said it with such sincerity like she knew exactly what conclusions I'd draw. I wasn't sure I believed her. It didn't matter. You're pretty beaten up, Jessica said. 
Can I sit? Please, I said, fighting not to let too much emotion into my voice. Chris is leaving the building, I think. I don't suppose you have any insights to share? Any tricks? Any ways to unravel the riddle that is... him? I felt a little light-headed, rambly. I think he's less of a riddle than just about every other member of your team, Jessica said. Oh, no magic words to convince him to change his mind, help us out? I can't imagine there are. But you thought he was a decent person? I thought he had a great opportunity to be one. When the therapy group formed a hero team, I thought two or more of them would go down the wrong track. It's a small miracle that it was only one. We were ignoring that another two had died. So it couldn't be helped? I asked. It could have, but you're not a therapist, Victoria. And I, as unwilling as I was to admit it, I wasn't prepared to be one either. Not in those circumstances, with those pressures. I should have pushed back harder against the team idea. We did some good. Absolutely. Some essential good, from what I hear. Battles won and mysteries solved that wouldn't have been uncovered without your hard work. I'd never does not... Damn it. Battles won and mysteries solved that wouldn't have been uncovered without your hard work. I'd never deny that. Cool. Then what went wrong? Battlefields made for... Er, make present tense. I'd never deny that. Cool. Then what went wrong? Battlefields make for terrible therapy couches, Jessica said. That's all. That's always been the case. Oh. I'm going to keep looking for people, Sveta said. Okay. Rain went upstairs, I said. Looking for you and for doctors. I'll go up then. There was a silence after she made her exit. I didn't know what to say, and Jessica didn't volunteer anything. I wanted to apologize to her so badly, and I suspected she wanted to do the same to me. We both left it unsaid. Are you still conscious? she asked. Yes. Good, she told me. I... hello. A cape was making his way up the stairs. A cape I'd seen with gun deck. I forgot the name. He stopped when he saw me. Is it true? He asked. Is what true? Your contingency plan that you gave to the wardens? Murder? Oh, I said. That was a last-ditch thing. It fell through. Good, he said. Who did you hear that from? Another cape. Your teammate told them. Cryptid, I said. Yeah. And that was that. That was the card he had up his sleeve. The threat he'd held in reserve if we tried to stop him. Now he was using it to force the warden's hand. People would react. The wardens would reassure. People would take measures to get out ahead of it. Contingency plan... Jessica asked. Kill all the capes, I said. Contagious, bio-altering sound, I think. It didn't matter how, just that it got enough of us. How? I don't think that would work. There are two things that the entities have always been bad at handling when it comes to us. Dreams. Rain's thing drove that home. But capes like Miss Militia and Swan Song... They had screwy retention and processing of data through their dreams. Swansong remembering things that Damsel did after dreaming, and vice versa. I don't know about Miss Militia's. She remembered her trigger every night when she dreamed. Doesn't matter. Dreams and death. We had enough come back from the dead. Mix the two. The idea was we'd put down every cape we could. Make the death slow and riddled with heavy dreams. Pollute the system so they can't use the data. Let Fortuna get her end of the world and find that there's nothing to send out there. 
force her to abort. Riley thought it would work. So did Cryptid. That's a heavy decision to make on behalf of tens of thousands. It's a heavy decision to make on behalf of billions, maybe trillions, to make the decision to not do it, I replied, while gently leaning my head and shoulder into the wall, despite the pain it produced. As Chris and the Seamorg just managed... Okay. All right, that was... God, I've already forgotten. That was 20.8. All right. 20.8. Last. And... 20.8. Oh, 20.8. Last. All right, that is saved. We're saving. Cool, 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 cool. Right. You are saved. Now, new. Okay. Resize you so I can see everything. more. It is very close to the end. I've got one more session after this, assuming I do two chapters next time as well. And that's it. Oh, I can't wait. It's so close. And then I'm going to wait to do the, uh, the last chapter until, like, basically I'm going to record it and then edit it and then post it. Um, so I'm going to wait till the very end to do that. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to do 20.9, like 8 and 9 today, and then it's 10 and 11 next time, and, and that's it. Yeah. Um, especially, so yeah, once I'm done recording, um, I'm going to switch over to editing for a little while, and, uh, that'll help speed up our release schedule. Hopefully we'll be, you know, two, three chapters a week until we're done, um, and that would be awesome. Um, yeah, my hope is to have all of this finished, like, done, done. No more chapters airing in a few months. Which would be... Oh my god. I I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I know what I'm going to do, do, do with myself, but I don't know what I'm going to do with myself when this is done. Uh, 22 billion word story, huh? Um, is it just... A, repeat it over and over again, because I could do that. Like, yeah, I, I could do that for you. Just record, like, ah, for several hours. <laughs> oh, man. I think I need to turn the fan up a little bit. It's getting toasty. <laughs> oh, spoilers, yeah. Oh, God. Watch, it's going to end with a single, like, B. <laughs> and that's the, the, the cliff, or no, sorry, that's the cliffhanger for the, uh, the sequel which will just be the letter B. I don't know how I'm going to voice that one. Just boo. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I, it is most certainly a landmark contribution of my life, for sure. Um, my only regret is that... Uh, I did Worm first. Like, Worm is the one that is, you know, massively more popular and, and you know, massively more accessible to people, I guess. But um, because it was literally the first 
voice work I'd ever done before, uh, and the first time managing a project like that, you know, the quality is not great. Um, it goes all over the place, and there's some readers who are like just subpar. Um, and so yeah, like lo a lot of people don't have a very high opinion of it, which is rightfully so. Uh, there's parts of it that are just hot garbage. Um, you know, my own my own contributions to it included. So, yeah, that's my only regret is that Worm was done first. I do need to go back and fix that Bakuda section, though. Maybe that's the first thing I'll do. I'm sure those chapters will take me like 20 minutes to record each. Yeah, I mean, it's okay to not like narrators, though. It, you know, everybody's got, especially for audiobooks, like, everybody's got preferences on, on what they're, because listening to another person talk is a very, like, specific thing. You have to really be okay with how they talk and their voice and everything to stand to listen to them tell you a story for hours on end. Uh, so, like, I get it. You know? And I mean, some of them, yeah, are, are lower in skill or lower in technical quality. Um, but there are also some that are lower in, in, in technical quality that are high in skill and high in skill and low in technical quality. It's, it's all over the place. Oh, yeah, I think I know which one you're talking about. And um, I believe it's actually already been redone. Um, I think it may have even been redone by the same person, just like two years later. Uh, but yeah, they're... Uh, I actually listened to through the entire Worm audiobook uh, as the chapters were aired, um, because you know with that one there was whole sections where I just didn't hear other people's work aside from you know like lightly skimming it, um, and yeah there there was only one chapter one interlude where I could not understand what the person was saying. Which is unfortunate. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I don't internalize it. Like everybody's got their own opinions about things. Like I'm very proud of the work we did. I know it could be better. Like I, I know it could be better. But you know, given my, like my skill level and stuff at the time, I'm very proud of what we did. And you know, people aren't gonna like it. That's fine. A lot of people do, which is great. And the same will go for this. Like, a lot of people are, are not going to be able to handle the concept of, you know, a man reading a woman's narration. Like, and that's fine. It, again, everybody's got their own preferences on what they're able to handle as far as audiobooks. <laughs> well, I don't know about the Sistine Chapel, but... It's something. Yeah. Well, for Worm, at least, none of us were. I think, uh... The only person in the project who had... Any experience... Uh, who was a regular, like, narrator was NSPB, and he'd done just, like, a couple little fan projects, and that was it. Yeah, it was... I... My... So, like, quality and everything aside, my biggest regret for Worm was the pace I'd set. Um, I, I wish... I had set it to, like, one chapter a week or two a week, something like that. Um, we were originally two a week, but then we went up to three once we'd gotten things going. Um, and that enabled us to finish within two years, but it was hell for me. 
constantly tracking people down, like following up with them, um, because the way it worked was we would assign out arcs well in advance so that, you know, everybody could be recording their arcs at the same time and we could keep up that pace. So, you know, if, if we were record like airing arc four, arc nine would be being recorded by somebody else, um, and they could take the, you know, two months or whatever it would take to do that. But, uh, yeah, like sometimes you would do that and you check in with them a month into those two months and they don't respond. And then you wait another week and they still aren't responding. And then you're a week before those chapters are supposed to air. And now what do you do? Like it was that things like that happened far more than I care to think about. Like, the, the amount of, of ghosting on that project was just nuts. Um, I think I had, for the majority of the project, I would get somewhere around a dozen emails a week from people interested in, in doing the project. Uh, of those, like, the first thing I would always ask was, um, sounds great, can you send me a quick clip so I can get an idea of... Uh, you know, your, your setup, and um, do you have a, you know, interlude chapter you would like to do? So, of those 12, six would reply to that. Um, of those six that would reply, maybe three would actually send me their clips. Of those three, maybe uh, one or two would actually claim a chapter, and of those two, maybe one would actually do it. And that was, like, ever for years. Two years. You know, time, times 50. I feel like it would have been a lot easier if Discord had existed around that time. Like, that entire project was coordinated through email. That was it. Like, I, I could have set up, like, an IRC server or something, but... Yeah, like, but the thing is, it, it like, even at that point, people, the vast majority of people didn't comprehend what that was and how that worked. Um, so getting people to do that wouldn't happen. Just, they, they would just disappear. Um, yeah, right. And again, yeah, there, there weren't a lot of, uh, like, non-purely gamer-oriented chat options at that time. It was kind of a weird window between the, the like, 500,000 different applications and the now where we have you know like a dozen or so very popular ones but yeah being able to coordinate all of this on discord so much easier oh my god like i i have a spreadsheet of contacts from worm that like i would update last like last, like I had columns for last time I had con like last date that I had contacted them and last date that they had responded to me, and like notes on who they were and what they were doing and what they like capabilities were and notes on on and columns for uh what chapter chapters they had contributed to, and columns for like if they were willing to to do more work or uh, and a column for if. Uh, if I wanted them to do more work. Yeah, I want to see... I really want to see Worm get published. Um, I, I think it has the potential for, like, mass market success. Um, I just don't... I don't think he wants to at this point. 
I think he likes the lifestyle he has, which, you know, that's great. You know, it works for him. Obviously, don't do the things you don't want to do. Um, I just feel like it's it's a bit of a shame. It's a bit of a loss to the world that uh, a story like that can't be broadcast to the masses in a way that the masses are uh, used to consuming. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. It's been slowly growing by word of mouth for, well, 10 years now. Um, but, you know, it's there's a lot of things that are extremely popular on the internet um, that have huge followings that stay, stay that, just stay there. Um, because the creators never wanted to do more with it or whatever, you know, everybody's got their own designs for their things. But, yeah. No, a, uh, anime style, I think, would be very appropriate for, for Worm. Um, yeah. I think it would work a lot. Especially because you get the, the, the cutaways with the internal monologues are a very common thing in anime. Um, you talking about the, uh, the, the CG one? Uh, with the fight against, um, uh, Mannequin? Oh, oh dear. Um, yes, yeah, that one. That is, oh, that is so, so awesome. That that person is both a exceptionally talented and b like they put in the work for that man. It is oh, it that that's like that's studio quality by a single person. Oh yeah. I, I can't even imagine how long that took them. Oh, yeah. Yep. Hire that person to hire all of the people they need to make that happen. And just say, money is no object. Get it done. Yeah, that would be so cool. In three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I need to turn these fans up more. It is still getting toasty in here. There we go. Oh yeah, now we got some airflow. Um, I looked at it a bit. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, yeah, no, no, the the Code Miko stuff is is just bonkers. The the like stuff that goes into that. Very very cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she is, like, she, she's she got that skill for, for maneuvering conversations. Um, that's just, yeah, it, it's very good. Ooh, 
I'm gonna need some more water here soon. All right, I am gonna start up 20.9 here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it'll happen eventually. Arc 20, last, chapter 9. The technology in my right eye winked out. It was still highlighting random things, showing text and countdowns I could no longer ascertain the meaning or relevance of, and it went dark turning my eye into an ordinary eye. If there was a light there, and I had no idea if there had been, there was nothing. For a long, spine-chilling moment, I didn't move a muscle or take a breath as I came to terms with the fact that that might be the world ending. Medical monitors beeped, machines hissed, and at least one person was out of it and either didn't care or didn't know how much noise they were making, Screams, grunts, and inarticulate cries. People looked stri- uh, Don't love that word. Which noise they were making. Screams, grunts, and inarticulate cries. People looked stressed, and they had a thousand times a thousand reasons to look that way. The area, at least, was well lit, although the brightness of the lights and the fact everything was white made my eyes hurt. My head was pounding. Even if my short sit-down with Jessica had let me recuperate enough, I didn't feel like even flying would make me pass out. A crew of nurses made their way through the throng of people who were sitting in the waiting area. Ten minutes had passed from my arrival, and I'd spent most of those ten minutes dwelling on the problem at hand. The wardens would be telling Dauntless and Fumehood not to engage. That gave us a short short clock when it came to the Seamorg's plan to end the world. Around the time those ten minutes had passed, I'd stopped thinking about plans and counterplans entirely. I'd started watching the nurse that looked like he was going to get to me first, my full focus turned toward him, the checklist of questions he was asking, and the answer to the nurse that looked like he was going to get to me first, my full focus turned toward him, the checklist of questions he was asked. Oh my god. What am I beep booping about here? Doesn't matter that looked like he was going to get to me first. My full focus turned toward him, the checklist of questions he was asking, and the answers I'd give. Could I make small talk? What would I say? If the world was really ending, could I make the interaction as pleasant as possible? It was stupid. So minor. It didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But it kept my mind off of the raspy burr to each of my breaths, the pain, and more than any of that, the fact I didn't really have any hope for the future. If my estimation was right, then literally any moment now, the Seamorg would be merging with Fortuna. If she'd miscalculated, then it could be a few minutes more. If I'd lost track of time to a sufficient degree, then it could already be happening, the scream imminent. And I was waiting in line, so to speak, sitting in a chair with a plasticky white cover on the padding, elbow to elbow with the people to my left and right in matching chairs. All right, miss? I turned my head too quickly. I winced as neck muscles pulled at my collarbone. A female nurse. Oh, uh, damn it. All right. Padding elbow to elbow with the people to my left and right in matching chairs. All right, miss? I turned my head too quickly. 
I winced as neck muscles pulled at my collarbone. A female nurse, not the one I'd been anticipating. The guy was stuck talking to someone elderly, a refugee or a Cape's family. Antares, isn't it? Yes, I said. My voice had that same just-been-sick burr to it. What do you need? My hand was holding the washcloth-sized pad of cotton to my collarbone. The cotton was stuck to blood and pulled at my skin, which pulled at the bone. I felt it grate and click, my expression changing to something like I was screaming even though the air was locked in my throat. A dribble of blood ran down from the pad's edge to the heel of my hand, down to my sleeve. It wasn't like I didn't already have a ton there. Okay, don't move that. Come with me. I think other people arrived before I did. I don't want special treatment. It's on a requirement basis. That's a clear break and serious blood loss. Do you need help? A, a chair? I can fly. Technically, I knew that they were giving us triage. I knew it wouldn't be a first-come, first-serve basis. At the same time, I was aware I didn't have any friends. The wardens didn't trust me after my altercations with Eric. Non-wardens had reasons to distrust me because they heard Chris's filtered version of my plan. <coughs> oh, God. <coughs> wardens had reasons to distrust me because they heard Chris's filtered version of my plan. Too many civilians were anti-parahumans. On a level... I just wanted to minimize stress on as many fronts as possible. I floated after the woman, who had ear decorations that threaded through holes in each ear, something that might have come from one of the cultures we ran into with all the inter- I floated after the woman, who had ear decorations that threaded through holes in each ear, Something that might have come from one of the cultures we ran into with all the interdimensional stuff. She kept looking back to check on me, her eyes flicking down to my feet, as if to confirm to herself that I was really flying. That I really was flying. God damn it. Something that might have come from one of the cultures we ran into with all the interdimensional stuff. She kept looking back to check on me, her eyes flicking down to my feet, as if to confirm to herself that I really was flying. I didn't run into that a lot. The hallway had a U-curve, with sections separated by walls, privacy provided by curtains that slid out in front to form a fourth barrier. People in patrol uniforms stood guard here and there, keeping the peace. Two of them were helping to carry a stretcher with a cape in heavy armor on it. It all felt so surreal. I'm sorry. I really hope the wardens have something. My thoughts were jarred as I saw Marquis. He glanced at me, saying nothing, before pushing a curtain aside just enough to step into the enclosure. Was she here? If there was a small peace to be found in the small kindnesses and smaller distractions, that possibly erased it, destroyed it. Dr. Close? the nurse asked. The doctor was in the center area, surrounded by nurses and papers that had been written on, not printed. And Daris, he said, I've seen you on television. Oh no, I said, deadpan in part because I was trying very hard not to provoke my injuries. I don't take sides, he said. That is a lot of blood right there. There's more, I said. Hard to see with the black top on. He shined a light in my eyes. Then at my mouth, I opened it. Close, he said. I did. He took my hands and looked at the fingertips. Well, the ones he could see with the bandages. Lip color is okay. Fingernails don't suggest circulation problems. Any confusion? Thoughts are a bit rambly. Dizziness? Yep. Sweating. I just fought the Seamorg. If I wasn't drenched in cold sweat, that'd be the problem. That's a yes? Yes. Breathe deep? 
I'd rather not. My ribs are fractured, broken, fucked, pretty fucked. My collarbone's really fucked, broken. I'm not sure about the ribs. So much for that thinking I'd done earlier about talking to that nurse and being really concise, making everything easier. It wasn't just my thoughts that were rambling. It could be a fracture, he said. I peeled the pad of bandage away, as much as I could. It helped I'd just done it a minute and a... A minute and a half ago. Sure, he said. I peeled the pad of bandage away, as much as I could. It helped I'd just done it a minute and a half ago. Minute and a half. The world is ending. The Seamorg is winning. Oh, he said, with enough surprise in his voice to bring me to the present. I almost jumped, and the only reason I didn't might have been that I was way too fucking tired. Oh, I asked. Broken, he said. That's what I said, I answered, my voice a whisper. I wasn't sure he'd heard, because he was preoccupied saying something to the nurse. He looked back to me. Abdominal pain? Chest pain? My ribs are pretty fucked, I reminded him, my tone tense. I felt bad enough sitting in a hospital cubicle while the world was fucking ending without him wasting time. Just running through. I'd like to get this costume top off you so we can get a better look at that. Nurse, if you could help Miss... help Antares here with her costume. I got it, I said. The nurse hesitated. My force field peeled away from me, moving me as little as possible. Force field hands brushed my hair off to the side over my good shoulder, nudging... tugging it, oops... It's possible. Force field hands brushed my hair off to the side over my good shoulder, tugging it where blood made it stick to cloth or skin. I began pulling it off in increments. I'll give you a moment of privacy while I check things, Dr. Close said. Told me. Increments. I'll give you a moment of privacy while I check things, Dr. Close told me. Help her if she needs it, Leia. Yes, Doctor. Did I scare him? I wondered. I didn't need it. I debated tearing at the cloth, but for one thing, I didn't want to scare them, and for another, I wasn't sure it was actually easier. It was sticking to my body from armpit to waist. Besides, I liked my costume, even if it was soaked in blood. I let her hold my arms gently raising and bracing them, holding them with a strength that didn't let them waver or shake. Handprints stood out against my skin. Do you have water? I asked. And a cloth or paper towel? We have bottled water. Why? Nurse Leia asked. Please, I said, my voice tense and my words curt because breathing was hard in this position the breaks and fractures making every sound an effort. She left, and I worked on extricating myself from my costume. Forcefield hands removed the breastplate, setting it aside. She returned with the water and a bit more of a cotton pad bandage. With forcefield hands, I wet the cloth and used it to soak the parts of me where sweat didn't reach but blood had. It had clotted and clung to tiny translucent body hairs all down my back, until skin, costume, and clotted blood were inextricable. The water helped. Once I got past the small of my back and my stomach, it was easier. My costume and the long-sleeved shirt I'd been wearing were inexplic- inexorably. Not inexplicably, there's a very- Once I got past the small of my back and my- it was easier. My costume and the long-sleeved shirt I'd been wearing were inexorably bound together. I put them to one side, folding them. Nurse Leia touched the force field, and I stopped. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. She reached out tentatively, touching it again, a hand on a shoulder. The fragile one slipped out of her grip, moving up to the bed, sitting just behind and around me. It was like I was the wretch again 
but only a part of me that was still shaped like ordinary two arms, two legs, one headed Victoria was there. The rest was invisible, invincible, and fragile. She's out of your way now. She? Secret, I said. The fragile one lifted the wet, scrunched together cotton cloth to my lips, then folded it roughly the dimensions and length of a finger. Not that secrets matter any more. Bra off, too. I have a paper gown for you. The athletic bra hugged my upper body, and more blood had settled into it, adhering it to my body. I was not looking forward to removing it. It was one of my favorites, too, though two days of exertion had probably halved its lifetime. I tore it off, the fragile one applying gentle pressure to my body to approximate the light constriction of it being... Oh, light constriction of it before digging days of exertion had probably halved its lifetime. I tore it off. Oh. Favorites, too. Lost my spot. Though two days of exertion had probably halved its lifetime. I tore it off, the fragile one applying gentle pressure to my body to approximate the light constriction of it before digging into it with fingernails, tearing the cloth. Skin pulled and wet bandaged helped Wet bandage helped to make the light constriction of it before digging into it with fingernails, tearing the cloth. Skin pulled and wet bandage helped with the tricky spots when it came to the stickiest bits of bloody cloth. I had more that would be a nightmare. I couldn't really see with my current posture and my inability to turn my head without feeling like my collarbone was being broken all over again, but I was very aware that blood had run down my body to adhere costume bottoms to underwear and underwear to skin. The nurse held the paper gown up against my front, and I had the fragile one hold it there. I didn't put my arms through the sleeve, and the nurse didn't ask me to. It was a pointless movement of my arms when every movement of my arms hurt, and I'd need to take it off anyway. Antares? the doctor asked. Yes, you can come in. I was just thinking, would you rather use your real name? You don't wear a mask. Victoria, Miss Dallin, Antares, whatever you want to call me, I said. He nodded. He had a pad and was writing things down. He put it down, then bent down, investigating my ribs. Tell me if it hurts. It hurts every damn time my heart beats, doctor. Heart beats. Bent down, investigating my ribs. Tell me if it hurts. It hurts every damn time my heart beats, doctor. He poked and prodded for a bit, then lifted his stethoscope. This'll be cold. Everything's cold, doctor. That's a concern when our most immediate concern is blood loss and or internal bleeding, he said. I mean, it's winter, and I'm not wearing a top. This building facility has holes in it you could fly an Endbringer or Dragon Mech through. I didn't know about the holes, he said. He pressed the stethoscope. Endbringer or Dragon Mech through. I didn't know about the holes, he said. He pressed the stethoscope. My god. Endbringer or Dragon Mech through. I didn't know about the holes. He said. He pressed the stethoscope to my chest. It was cold. He touched my wrist, then my hand. Your body temperature is a bit low, even with all of that. If nothing else, I appreciated being in this hospital room because it was distracting me. I could focus on the little things, like keeping the rest of my blood in, not passing out, how to articulate the damage to my ribs, and how to gently remove articles of clothing using alien engines of chaos and conflict. Fuck. I'd choose to feel like this for the rest of my life. Broken collarbone, every breath sparking a thought-disturbing bit of pain. Cold and sticky. If only it meant if I... If only it meant I... Oh, there was no if there. Damn it. Every breath sparking a thought-disturbing bit of pain. Cold and sticky. 
If only it meant I didn't have to fee break. I would have forgone any fixes at all, let these wounds stay open, if only someone from somewhere else in the facility would walk in and say there was a plan. Do you happen to know what your blood... Do you happen to know your blood type? I don't know why I put that what in there. If only someone from type. somewhere else in the facility would walk in and say there was a plan. Do you happen to know your blood type off the top of your head? Dr. Close asked me as he jotted some things down. B negative. We're going to get you some, he said without looking up. Disrupts powers, doesn't it? I asked him. Temporarily? I was about to mention that. No guarantees, but there's a small chance you won't be able to do that trick with the... What's that? Telekinesis? Basically, I said. I'd like to keep my powers available, just in case. Just in case. You won't have anything if you go into hypovolemic shock. Can I get you to lie down? The nurse can assist. I fly. I can. I made the transition to lie flat on my back. The fragile one held the paper gown against my front. Leia, a blanket, if you please. I think they just brought more in. On it, doctor. It was harder to breathe while laying down. I let the doctor putter around, preparing the space for things to come. My flight kept me from pressing down too hard on the bed. A distant screech built up in volume. Horror gripped me, lingering even as I processed it as hospital equipment or someone's power, not the Seamorg's scream. <clears throat> I winced, because the sound had induced a bit of panic, and the panic came with heavier, faster breathing. My hand gripped the edge of the bed. We'll need you to sign a consent form, he told me. In the wake of the noise, it hit me harder. I shivered. The blood transfusion. If I said yes to it, I was effectively surrendering, saying there was nothing more. My fight was done. No powers, no nothing. Knock, knock. Ugh, fuck. Was this a bad thing? A good thing? Can I come in? The doctor looked at me. A friend? I didn't know how to answer that. I'm topless, except for a bit of paper. I don't know if you care about that, I said, raising my voice. I was a warlord. I've cut throats, had my throat cut. I've shot people, Tattletail said as she let herself in. I really don't care about your boobs. I rolled my eyes. I wanted to move my head, too, but that wasn't an option. Are you here for a particular reason, Tattletail? I asked. Chastity. She got a good knock to the noggin. Cassie's fretting and Rachel needed to be told it'd be better if she stepped away instead of getting cranky about it. I saw Marquis and a certain someone take their leave, realized you were here. Hmm. My neck and side hurt like heck. Oh, fuck. She said fuck. I saw Marquis and a certain someone take their leave, realized you were here. Mm. My neck and side hurt like fuck. Did you think I needed a pointed pain in my ass instead? You don't have to. Nah, hun, just checking in. You did your brute destroy ger arg thing. You apparently forgot you're supposed to be invincible. Now your job is done. Mine is ongoing. Gathering info. I just told you I was a warlord. I'm still managing, administering, administrating. Gathering info. I just told you I was a warlord. I'm still managing, administrating, moving key pieces around. Rah, rah, I said. So I'll get right to it, she told me. A lot of the pieces are running around very upset and concerned about something that apparently started with you. Uh-huh, that. I want to play a little game, Vicky. If I say black, you say white, I ventured. Yeah, she said, like it was the most profound thing ever. 
Can I kick her out? I asked Nurse Leia, who had just made her way inside, navigated around Tattletail, and who was now draping a weighted, warm blanket over my legs. You could. Listen, Tattletail said. That's the way it's supposed to be. I say black, you say white. I say let's literally nail teacher's ass to a wall, and you're supposed to say that's wrong. I'm a bad person for using cruel and unusual punishment. Do you want her to leave? The nurse asked me. I'm really tempted. Except you went and came up with a punishment way worse than putting a tire around someone's neck and setting it on fire. You never did that. Exactly my point. You're making me look too good with your indefinite juryless detention, and now I hear you were apparently planning on mass murder. The nurse gave me a look, and it wasn't her checking if I wanted Tattletail to leave. One line from Tattletail, and the nurse was wary, not entirely on my side anymore. Can you give us a minute? I asked. The doctor and nurse made their exit. In the background, I heard someone grunting and screaming. There was a clatter. It's more than just that, I told Tattletail. Cryptid gave a pretty trite one-line explanation. There were contingencies, plans, post-plans. Oh, I know, Tattletail said, which is part of the reason I'm here, checking. You had teammates going along with it, including a goody two-shoes like Sveta and a kid who's got a lot to redeem herself over. The wardens were entertaining it, despite the fact you're not in their good books. I'm okay in their good books, I think. You're not in their best books. Conceded, I grunted. So there's more to it, Tattletail said. It was a last-ditch effort. Riley, Bonesaw... So there's more to it, Tattletail said. It was a last-ditch effort. Riley, Bonesaw, thought it would work. So did Cryptid. We send capes to fight Endbringers knowing that a good proportion will die. We have to send a certain number, or they win, and we lose something fundamental. I think I said we hast. Cryptid. We send capes to fight Endbringers knowing that a good proportion will die. We have to send a certain number, or they win, and we lose something fundamental. Sure, Tattletail said. Now we've got forces worse and stronger than a single Endbringer lined up. It requires us to commit more, with a higher proportion of death. One hundred percent. Maybe, I said. I used flight to get to a sitting position, holding the paper dress in front of me and the bandage to my shoulder. Does it matter? We don't have what we need. The Seamorg got one ahead of us. Got out ahead of us. <clears throat> Does it matter? We don't have what we need. The Seamorg got out ahead of us. Does it matter? We don't have what we need. The Seamorg got out ahead of us. It matters to me, Tattletail said. I've tolerated a lot, spending time with you, helping out your teammate. I laughed, one note, then winced with pain. But I have to draw the line here, Tattletail said. I lost someone important to me because she wanted to make a stupid, grand gesture at the end. She made the gesture without communicating with anyone, except your sister. Then she carried it out. You, I hate to break it to you, aren't important to me. Good. I'm glad. But I have no tolerance for this shit. Zero. The wardens knew. My teammates knew. Lookout accepted. The plan was to ask every single cape out there if they'd oblige us. Maybe we'd force the problem elements. The ones we'd sign off on executing anyway, I mean. The monsters. And whatever. Yeah. The effect would be passed from cape to cape by contact. But it required that handshake. I think Cryptid thought it wasn't worth it, that we'd get halfway and fail because people wouldn't take the risk, wouldn't make the sacrifice. I have teammates who would have taken your offer. 
I don't think I can be okay with that. I am fucking open to better ideas, anything, I told her. But I'm worried the warden's contingency plans won't work. They aren't. They... Sleeper has been baited in. No luck. Saint had a trick up his sleeve when it came to dealing with an a... They aren't. They... <clears throat> Sleeper has been baited in. No luck. Saint had a trick up his sleeve when it came to dealing with AI in case Big Red Button for dealing with Dragon didn't work. He's trying it on the machine army. And? And nothing. There's talk of Dragon cooperating with him. I shivered. I wanted to wrap myself in the blanket, and I was pretty sure my bones couldn't bear the weight of it. My arms were limp to my side. Forcefield fingers were running through my hair, combing it, and I didn't remember doing that. They were sharp, scraping my scalp without cutting it. Tattletail took a seat on the side table, her arms folded. The Wardens aren't a force for change, Victoria. The PRT, aside from its initial revolution and moves back in Bet, it wasn't a force for change. They're all about the status quo. The bigger they get, the more they have to hold back. They're too used to holding back. They don't have that frame of mind to make the big leaps. At most, they prolong the inevitable. That's a little uncharitable. I'll give them their due. They're doing their damnedest. We're out of time, Tattletail, I said, quiet. What they're doing isn't working, and you're here, trying to vet my plan. Trying to fathom it, when it's the one action you could take that's furthest from my ability to understanding. It's reckless. It is, a bit. There's nothing noble about putting lives on the line, Victoria. It's even less noble when thousands do it. You say that even when... you knew Kepri? I asked her. No comment. Do you have anyone you care about? I asked her. That you'd make a sacrifice for? Most of the people I care about to that degree are people with powers, and they'd be getting the touch of death. It would be a dreaming death, I said. Slow but inevitable. Gotta pollute the cycle. It's critical that it take a little while. Makes the rest of it easier. Uh-huh. You said most when you said most were capes. Are there any that aren't? One person who doesn't have powers, who's far, far away right now, she said. You haven't really convinced me. I haven't exactly been trying. I'm a little dizzy. I'm supposed to get blood, even though it might muck with my powers and screw up my newfound relationship with this girl here. I touched the side of the fragile one's face. Tattletail leaned to one side, peering past the gap in the curtain. I don't know, I said. I've been outlining it, that's all. There's more to it. Steps. Stages. What would you say if you wanted to convince me? Is there a point, Tattletail? If that's where you draw your period line in the sand, give your past experience... Oh, oh personal line in the sand. Wow. Would you say, if you wanted to convince me? Is there a point, Tattletail? If that's where you draw your personal line in the sand, giving your past experiences, I'm not going to fight you on that. The feelings are valid, and I think we'd only fuck up our fragile truce here if I tried. Not my past experiences. Current experience, she said, meeting my eyes. As a person left behind. Sure. I said. I shivered again. There's a way, she said. I stared at her. The goosebumps that crawled up my arms had nothing to do with the chill. Tell me, I told her. No. Tell me, I told her again, rising to an upright position, my toes a half inch off the floor. I used my aura, pushing at her, big. All throughout the hospital complex, conversations stopped. Everything went quiet. Tattletail stood strong. You haven't convinced me. You'd take Rachel from me? Gru? Again? Imp? Chicken fucking little? The heartbroken kids? Potentially. People will die no matter what happens, Tattletail. It's a question of whether it's 100% or 60 or 25%. If we do nothing... 
it's 100%. If we do nothing, the Seamorg might win. We live. We won't be us, and you fucking know it, Tattletail, I told her. She was silent. There wasn't a hint of a grin on her face. You'd rather die, I said, than see people you love die. My life is defined by regrets, she said, and I don't know if I'm that different from cryptid. I don't trust the people who are pushing for status quo, and when people are taken from you, it's not noble or good or pretty. There's no heroism to fighting cancer or hurling yourself against an endbringer and hoping it goes away. I thought of Dean, of thoughts I'd had not long after losing him. It's just an ending, Tattletail said. You could go, in place of Imp, or in place of Chicken Little. What number are we trying to reach, then? Tattletail asked me. You didn't sound sure about how many would need to die. I'm absolutely not. Someone moved on the other side of the curtain. Tattletail flicked at the curtain itself, reached out with a hand as if to tell someone to stop, people reacting to the aura. She clenched the outstretched hand, then brought it down to her side, balled into a fist. Then how many, Victoria? How many people do we need to convince in a painfully short period of time? What's the point I can say we've met the threshold? I can trick Imp into staying home, or trick Chicken Little. She looked so sad, like she was about to cry. I hadn't seen Tattletail like that felt more like her than any other conversation I'd ever had with her. Enough, I said. Insufficient. It's the way it's always been. Against Endbringers, against Scion. The more, the better. And if we don't get enough, then everyone loses. Vista doesn't get her knight in shining armor, and Capricorn doesn't get to blow off years of pent-up steam with Vista. It's not about that. He's not about that. If you go, then you'll break Capricorn's parents' hearts again. How about that? You're leaving Lookout alone, or you're asking that poor kid to die alone, despite the fact that... If you go, then you'll break Capricorn's parents' hearts again. How about that? You're leaving Lookout alone, or you're asking the poor kid to die alone, despite the fact that it's her worst fear... You're asking Precipice to end his journey unfinished. Sveta never gets to be a human for a prolonged period, doesn't get normal dorky dates with a creative boyfriend. You're using your power to get details. That's low. Of course I fucking am, Antares. I've been working my ass off to save those people. I've gone without sleep. I've had migraines every third fucking day. So if you want to convince me, you've got to tell me it's somehow worth it to end every single one of those people's stories where they currently are. Miserably unfinished. I raised my good arm, then let it fall. That's not an argument. It's an argument you don't like. It's... If it comes to that, any one of those people, those bad endings... I think we're willing to do it for their own reasons. We are, Sveta said from beyond the curtain. She slipped through. Her tendrils were writhing. I saw a glimpse of rain on the other side. Gru, too, his back to the curtain. A story half finished is better than no story at all, Sveta said. If we die, there's nothing. No legacy, nobody to remember or carry on sentiments. There's no point to it at all. Oh, there's no point to it all. I, there's nothing. No legacy. Nobody to remember or carry on sentiments. There's no point to it all. There's so many other people out there with their own lives, I told her. Or I told... Damn it, just redo that. He'll hydrate. No legacy, nobody to remember or carry on sentiments. There's no point to it all. There are so many other people out there with their own lives, 
I told Tattletail. Civilians? Jerks? Capes who ran from these battlefields? It's basic fucking empathy to not want to end their stories either. The world didn't start and finish with the people you know. I heard a sound, a deep voice. Brian murmuring words that sounded agreeable, though I couldn't make them out. The world isn't worth keeping if they're not in it, Tattletail said. That's a big if and you know it, I said. I don't know if you're disagreeing on principle, given your past. A horrible, slow, nightmare-filled death for thousands? That may be pointless? That's not principles, Tattletail said. I think we let people choose, I told Tattletail. I think we give them the information and we let them choose. If we don't end up getting enough, they're just getting a head start. I think you know that we should, and that's why you're standing here arguing with me, wanting me to say words that make this easier or simpler, or wanting me to force you to tell me so you're absolved. I knew, telling her, that there was a chance she'd realize and walk away, or hit a wall, or anything. When using my aura to provoke an emotion, I knew there was to evoke. There was a chance she'd realize and walk away, or hit a wall, or anything. When using my aura to evoke an emotion, I knew there was a chance that a certain person's lens for viewing the world would alter the response. I could give a man fear and get anger in response. Words were the same. I watched as Tattletail took in that information through her particular lens. I watched her turn, pushing aside the curtain with more force than was necessary, giving people a view of me wounded and unarmored before Sveta closed the curtain. You have a call, Tattletail's voice came from the other side of the curtain. That communication with Fortuna you were planning. Lookout's handling the technical side. You know where she is. You'll want Precipice with, since he's the one that got through to her in the first place. It might help. That wasn't an answer. That wasn't... If you need to get Riley or her stuff to a place you can use her, there are non-cape ways. Several. I picked up my blood-crusty costume with the fragile one, pulling it on. The rush of realization providing a dizzying threatened to make me pass out at the same time it dulled the edge of the pain. Sveta followed, with Rain jogging along. Samiramis was out there, with Tattletail. As Tattletail gestured in my direction, I felt my collarbone pop. My costume shed crusty blood. My first thought was that it was a trap, that she was rewinding my memories as well, in a final action of regret. But I didn't feel anything slipping away. It felt better. Or I felt better. That she was rewinding my memories as well in a final action of regret. But I didn't feel anything slipping away. I felt better as the worst of my wounds were targeted, undoing what had been done, giving me just a bit more strength, a bit more of what I needed. Which fit. Outreach possibly final, from Tattletail. It served as a push forward, and recognition that she understood, even though she'd never be able to use words to voice it. Insert time jump beat here. Fortuna, I'm... I'm hoping it's the person that hears me, not the Titan. If you have any fight left, I need it now. I need you. You can tell your agent we'll give them Fumehood and Dauntless. They'll know we're telling the truth. I need your help, and the help of the Titans you're linked to. Poof, Valkyrie, person to one place. You should be able to defeat the Seamorg and all the pieces fall into place just as they want them. Please. Thank you. Okay.
20.9. All done. Thank you. 20.9 last. Yep, have a good night, Bale. Thanks for watching. All right. Well, as per usual, I am not going to make you all sit through my finalizing steps where I, you know, bring this down to mono and normal of that. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to end the, the stream here. It's, uh, what are we at? 7.30? Not bad. Okay, well, next time will be the end. Oh, boy. I cannot freaking wait. Oh, my God. Um, probably going to be, let's see, oh, maybe Monday. Um, I'm going to do some more Death Stranding this weekend, likely, and uh, um, I guess we'll see how Death Stranding goes. I may switch over to doing some uh, Wildermyth after a while. Um, yeah, so that's that. Thank you for watching. And I shall see you next time.